Well folks, we're ready to begin part two on the Panzer T758 ES build. Made it down the hill and onto the lift table here in the garage. So the first thing I'm going to do is get these brake drums pulled off and take a look inside. Moving this thing around the driveway, it didn't have any brakes and they weren't grabbing. And also the return springs for the pedals are also broken. So we're going to get this tire pulled off of here and see if we can get the drums off without having to use too much heat with any luck. So I do have a wheel puller that I've used on these before. I think it will fit on these five lugs. But what we're going to do first is see if I can smack the end of the axle and get the drum to pop off. That has worked on these before, but of course it depends upon just how stuck everything is on the axle. Alright, so obviously hitting the end of the axle doesn't work. Sometimes that'll create enough inertia to pop a tapered, because these are tapered axles on here, to pop a tapered hub off. But I know they're, they're pretty well rusted, so before we get the torch out, I have this really old wheel puller on here. Unfortunately, when I found this, I never had a third leg with it. I only have two legs, so it's kind of pulling a little bit crooked. So I have a couple of chisels wedged in here, so that way it keeps it from doing this and popping up. So we'll tighten this down smack the end of it and see if that's enough to break this free off of that axle. And there you have it folks, it just broke free. So it saves us from having to get the torch out on this side at least, which is always nice. And quite possibly on the shoe. And there's a the spring, folks. Just about every Panzer I've been into always has a broken return spring. So on these rear ends, they used Chrysler rear ends on these Panzers. And what they all they did is they took off the top shoe and they just made it actuate with just a bottom shoe because that's really all you needed on these little tractors. So we're just going to get all this cleaned up. Still got plenty of room down to the rivets. It's a little bit close in the front, but for what we're going to be doing with this thing, I'm not that worried about it. And of course, I'll get the drums all cleaned up. I'll wire wheel the inside of those. That way they're nice and smooth again and the shoes grab fairly well. Alrighty, so here's the brake assembly all cleaned up and everything. So the return spring mounts on this little tang right here on the pedal and then it goes down to this hole on the shoe so it would span that gap and of course it would pull the shoe and the pedal up when you let off the brakes. And right now this shoe isn't moving very well. I have to tap it with a hammer to get it to move. So we're going to remove this pivot point here. There's a nut on the back side of it. That way we can clean up where the shoe pivots and make sure that's moving freely so that way when the spring goes back on everything returns back to where it should. So after a little bit of persuasion a little bit of penetrating oil. The shoe is moving up and down and it's stuck on this pivot point here, which is good because it freed it up from this backing plate. So now I can actually drive from the back, drive everything out that way, get it out onto the bench and then free everything up. Brake shoe and rear pivot pin are all cleaned up and ready to go back in. So this rear pivot bolt here, which is what I'm going to call it, as you can see it has an oblonged machined portion to it. So that way when you turn it and move the shoe back and forth, I don't know what it's specifically called, but what it's going to end up doing, nearest I can figure, is when the drum goes on here, you want the shoe obviously to sit in like so. So you have full contact all the way across the pad. So with that rear bolt, it's going to keep it from doing this or doing that. So when you turn that rear bolt through the hole back there, it'll settle that in to the bottom of the drum that we have full contact along the surface of that shoe. So let's get ready to be bolted back in. 
and I also have the adjuster. I ran that over the wire wheel, oiled everything up, greased it, and that's ready to go back in as well. I just have this snugged into here right now so when I turn this it doesn't move it by much but you should be able to see the shoe moving a little bit back and forth so on the face of these there's an arrow cast into it that's facing up and that is the top that is the topmost portion on that oblong area so the highest point is going to be facing up and that's how it was in here so I'm going to put it back likewise to that and then we can see how the shoe grabs the drum once everything's put back in. Because as long as it's centered, the rest of the slack and adjustment you're going to take up when you adjust the adjuster that goes over to the pedal. And now, of course, with the exception of this clip holding it, we have a nice, freely moving brake shoe. And of course, now our adjuster can go in. So now that the shoe and everything is mounted, we have to get our return spring for the pedal on here. And these original springs that came on these, I haven't been able to find these anywhere. I've searched through brake warehouses and online and nothing came up that was close to them. So over the years, we've used different springs here and there, miscellaneous stuff we had kicking around. Well, I do have these that I think are gonna work. And these are the return springs from a Ford 8N brake assembly and I had them kicking around in the service truck because I did the axle seals and a brake job on one and I kept these figuring they might come in handy and I think these are going to be just enough to fit this one's got a kink in it but I don't think it's going to make a lick of difference they're very heavy springs and you can see how close we are to this tang up top and even regardless of that they have enough pull to them where I believe they're going to be strong enough by the time I get them up there to pull the pedal back up along with the shoe. There you have it folks. That's got plenty of tension on it. So that's a pretty slick spring to fit in there. So if anyone's doing these and they have busted springs, Ford 8N return springs for the tractors, they just seem to fit the bill fairly well. So we'll save that one for the other side. And now we can get the drum on here and get this shoe adjusted so that way the brakes work properly. So the drum is all cleaned up. As you can see on the inside, hopefully it's a little bit scored, but it's really not that deep. But I got all the heavy rust out of it, ran some sandpaper over it, so that'll be good enough for what this is. So on these Panzers, you have your brake adjuster right here, and there's a hole in the back. And there's also this little plate that you have to take off, and this slips through the back, like here, right here and clips over the adjuster like so and that's what holds it in place to keep it from moving so you gotta pop that off of there right now i have this adjusted as tight tight up as it can go so it's at the lowest point or the highest point i guess depending on how you're looking at it so i got the axle cleaned up cleaned up the keyway and the key and i have grease on everything so that way if i have to pull these off again i can hopefully without too much trouble so we're just going to set that on there like so, without putting the nut on it. It's nice and tight back up on the taper. All right, so now what we can do is reach around back and adjust our brake adjuster, which that's going to take a 5 8 wrench, and i got a stubby one here. So what we can do, what I probably should have done, is speed this up a little bit. As you can 
do this by hand with the drum off and run that shoe down until the drum doesn't slide on and then take it back a little bit, slide the drum on and then give it your final adjustment. So it's just hitting it right there. And they don't give you a lot of room to come back here and swing this wrench around. Unfortunately, you have to keep flipping it too, so it takes a little bit. Alright, so that's all the way on there now. You might be able to hear it just dragging on that shoe. So we'll bring it back a little bit more. So if you just barely tap that pedal, it's grabbing. And there's a pretty fair amount of travel in these pedals. Granted, you don't want to be sucking your heels all the way down if you have to stop quick. But I'm going to bring it up just a little bit more to give the pedal a little bit of travel. That way I know the shoe's not dragging on the drum. Now, I think that would be sufficient, folks. I don't know if you can see the rod over there. Nope, looks like you can't. So, we have just a little bit of pedal travel. It probably moves about a quarter of an inch in the slot underneath the pedal, and that'll be plenty to get this tractor to stop. So we'll get the axle nut back onto here, tighten up this side, and then we can move over to the other side. Yeah, this side was loaded with acorns. Looks like there was no cover in here for the for the adjuster, so they must have got in there and nested for a while. Still has a broken lift spring though for the pedal. Brake parts are all cleaned up and ready to go back in. Unfortunately, the shoe that came out of this side, the lining was all broken off of it. It's being that the mice were in there for so long, the lining popped off and wasn't any good anymore. Luckily enough, I had one on the parts machine out back. As you can see, it's starting to separate a little bit on the shoe right on the top here, but it's still glued on on the other side and that'll be good enough for what this tractor is gonna be. So now we can start with reassembly. For this side, I also found another one of these lock-off plates on the parts machine out back. That way it'll keep the mice from getting back into there again.
Now that the rear brakes are taken care of, I'm going to get a lot of the nitpick work squared away before I put the engine in and then check back with you guys when that time comes. Because there's really nothing all that special that I'm going to be doing. I just ran a grease gun through everything on the tractor and everything took grease. The front end, I do have to rebush one of the tie rods. And on these T-Series Panzers, what they did is they used rubber grommets in pieces of flat bar and they had a quarter 20 with a bushing that went through the grommet because you could see how you can't tighten it down even even though this piece is actually bent on this side but to get the gist of it when the front end flexes that's what the grommet does because you can see the bolt is torqued a little bit so i'm going to take this bolt out and do what somebody did over here and put a 5 16 in with another piece of bushing stock and that'll be good enough because these two middle bolts here on the arm for the steering still have bushings in them and they're just loose enough where it'll still flex as it should and usually what i have done in the past is i've threaded 3 8 rod and put formal ball joints on these and gotten rid of the flat bar tie rods but for this one we're going to be keeping the flat bar so i'm going to do that i'm going to get some of this wiring taken out of here get the gas tank taken out i do have to free up the throttle and the choke cables they do move very very stiff so I think I could salvage those and we'll be able to reuse those again. So I got some small stuff just to take care of. And then when it comes time to getting the engine mounted into here, I'll check back and we'll be ready to drop that in. So a couple of things to note here while I'm making progress. This big aluminum drive pulley on the front is pretty well oxidized and corroded up from sitting outside for so many years. And it's pretty darn heavy too. So what I did is I just cleaned up one groove here with the wire brush. I might do third gear too. So when the engine is on here, what I'm going to do is just block up the rear end and then I can clean this up with some scotch Bright and some wire brushes and whatnot as it's spinning. I was going to knock it off here, which I did get it to move and I got the set screws in here to loosen up. But the problem is to take this off, you have to take off the steering arm and the grill and I'm not going to get that far into it. So the scotch Bright and the wire brushes will be just fine once I get everything moving. Also, the tie rod as I'd mentioned before, this turns out this is actually a 5 16 So I got it apart, so I figured I'd show you guys what it looks like and what they did. Is as you can see, it's a 5 16 bolt, and there's a piece of bushing stock that they slid up it. And you can see what's left over from the rubber grommet that was through that piece of flat bar. Because you can see they have a half inch hole through here, 5 16 hole through there. And having that grommet in here just acts as a buffer with the bushing stock in between it and it acts like a joint that way everything can move and flex around so what we're going to end up doing is putting a 3 8 bolt in there with a piece of half inch od and 3 8 id tubing similar to what they did with the other side and then we'll just have it everything flex up in here at the steering arm so there is one more adjustment to the drive system that we have to make and that is this drive shaft here the main drive shaft that feeds the rear end so what you have to do is adjust your, your chain tension. And I know this chain is pretty well worn, but it can be brought up a little bit. So there's a bolt and a jam nut underneath here, as you can see on that plate. And that pushes up on this piece right here on the inside where it goes down into the sleeve. And it pushes this up and that tensions your drive chain that is underneath this hood. And after that is done, you also have to move this foot here upwards. As you can see, when the shaft goes up, that has to go up as well has a small set screw here and you can wiggle this up a little bit retighten the set screw and then everything is moving on the same level and nothing is jammed up and of course your chain has tension on it again i was also able to get the throttle and the choke cables loosened up so those are all freed up now we have throttle and we have choke cables are actually in pretty tough shape but the choke one i took off and put in the bench vise outside knocked that free and the choke one or the throttle rather was actually moving so with a little bit of oil those things freed right up and now that it's time to install the engine i brought down the other Kohler that was on the pallet that we had to choose from and this one still has the engine drive pulley on it i do have a couple of other drive pulleys but i want to use this one given the nature of the tractor i might as well use this used one instead it does have a couple of chunks missing from third gear in the back but I'm really not all that worried about it. I'll just make sure everything's beveled and cleaned up nicely so it doesn't chew up the belt. And I think that'll be just fine. So I don't know how tightly this is on here. We're going to take out the set screws and just put a puller around it right here and see if we can get it to pop off the crank. Worst case, we could take it outside and warm it up with the torch and then put the puller on it and see if we can get it to move.
Well, you can't beat that, folks. It's coming right off real nice. Oddly enough, the same thing happened when I went through the T70 Krusty Panzer a number of years ago. That drive pulley came right off of that engine, too. Sure beats the heck out of having to heat the thing up and play around with the puller on the pry bars for an hour or so. Excellent. All right, we're finally starting to look like a regular tractor, folks. The engine pulley that I pulled off of the spare K181 before the engine went in that you guys saw, I had wiped out all the clips from that because I ended up running into an issue with it, and you might be able to see it down there. There's a ridge going around the far end, and this pulley must have been loose on that engine for a number of years when someone was running it, and it just beat the snot out of that bore. So it's very loose when I tighten it down, and it's actually cockeyed when it goes on there. So I know it's going to wobble when I start the engine up. So what I did is I brought down that Briggs that was also on the pallet out back, and I just pulled this engine pulley off, and this has a nice, true one-inch bore on it, nice and straight, and nothing is worn or anything. So we're going to end up using this one instead, and I can have this one bored out and bushed at a later date for a spare engine pulley. Engine pulley is all mounted up, along with the reverse disc. And out of the three discs that I had, that seemed to be the best one. It's got some pretty deep cracks in it, but luckily enough, it's still pliable, so it shouldn't gouge into that aluminum pulley too much with the hard rubber. Worst case, I can always buy a new one. And we also have a drive belt on there. It's a 4L330 half-inch wide belt, and if you want a little extra grip, a 5L340 will also work on here, which I didn't happen to have in stock, but I did have a 4L, so that's what it's got. So now that the engine drive stuff is all set, this morning I went ahead and painted up our gas tank and cleaned this out in the glass bead blaster. This is a nice solid tank and somebody had blasted it years ago and it was just all surface rust sitting in the parts pile and the interior is nice. It doesn't have any pinholes or anything like that in it and unfortunately the original tank, well the one that was at least was in here was completely shot. It had a lot of rust in it and a lot of pinholes. So that has to get mounted once the hood gets on here but right now what we're going to do is get the throttle and the choke cable squared away. I'm only going to put the throttle cable on this because being that it's a pull start engine you're not going to be sitting on it when you're starting it so I can just flip this by hand and also the cable doesn't really fit very well coming around here and up to the choke. So what I'm going to do is just tie that up like this on the inside once the hood is on there and we'll just have a throttle cable which will be good enough. So mounting the throttle cable on this thing is pretty straightforward and when I had went over freeing up these throttle cables on a couple of clips ago. What we are going to be doing is using the black handled one for the throttle versus the red handled one. It's on the outside. It's already bent in the right position so I think it's going to be a lot easier to use and then the red handled one will tie up underneath the hood on a clip. So all I use for these are these tiny little cable clips here and I end up getting these through rotary and they come in pretty handy for obviously enough doing throttle and choke cables. So we're just going to put that through a little disc here on the governor. These clips are usually a little bit small for the older cables, but they're also fairly pliable metal anyways. So you can just bend everything right around it. Of course you want to make sure the clip is in the right position with the cable first before you go tightening it on there. So right about there should be good. I brought the throttle cable up just a little bit on the bracket. That way if it's not exactly where it should be, it has a little bit of travel down to low throttle to compensate for the clip not being in the right spot. Now we have a proper working throttle cable. It doesn't take much to pull these 8 horse throttles from the way they made the governor set up. I never liked them versus the 10 through the 18 horse single cylinders, but they seem to do what they have to do and fit the bill, so that'll work out just fine. 
if I have to, I can always adjust this up a little bit further so it's more comfortable to use, which I might do right now, actually, and then the throttle will be taken care of. Mounting up the gas tank comes next. So in order to do these tanks, you have to get the hood mounted down and then mount the brackets for the tanks, and then you can slide the tank underneath because these two bolt holes right here go through these two bolt holes right here where the hood sandwiches down onto the front. One thing that I am going to do while putting these hood bolts in is I'm going to put a longer one in this corner. That way I have room to bolt the cable clip for the unused choke cable up under the hood. So on these Panzer hoods, when you tighten them down, it's usually best if you start from the top and work your way down on the bolts, which is what I did here on the steering column, because they always seem to sit on the nose and on the dash, they'll sit up like this. They'll hump up a little bit. So if you start in the middle here and work your way out, it'll kind of, it'll sit more flush up against this area instead of tightening down the edges and having it come up like this and you end up with a gap in the front. With the exception of the front of the hood, everything has been bolted down. So I have the gas tank underneath here dry fitted along with the brackets. And you guys can see where the two middle bolts go through. That way it holds on the brackets. So when this gas tank sucks up close to the top, it ends up hitting those nuts. And to keep everything from wearing through as it vibrates, I am gonna cut a piece of inner tube, just a strip, to go all the way around this clamp and then over where these nuts come through for the bolts. That way it doesn't chafe over time and end up wearing a hole in the gas tank because this is a nice gas tank. So I'm gonna get that cut, finish bolting in the tank, and I'll show you guys what it looks like when everything's in place. Fuel tank is all mounted up and in place, along with the choke cable that we have all tied up with a small clamp on that bolt. And the last thing I have to do is add a fuel line and a filter, and we'll be all squared away. All right, folks, only one thing left to do is to roll it outside, fire this thing up, and then we can start cleaning up these pulleys. That way we can run the belts on them.
Well, folks, we have ourselves a nice addition to the Panzer lineup. So this will look good beside the T70 this year at the tractor show. And the only issue, the only issue that I've been having with this now that I got it running, and of course it ran fine on the bench, but when you idle it down, the thing wants to load up for some reason. The carburetor wants to flood, and I'm not too sure why. I already changed out the float twice and the needle and seat. Adjusted a couple of times at different heights and it's doing the same thing. So there could be an orifice that's plugged in the carburetor for the breather for the bowl or it could be something else. But either way, I have more eight horse carburetors. So worst case, I'll rebuild one come springtime and get that changed out and put in there. But aside from that, the thing drives nice. It's a little goofy for me because I'm six foot two and I got really long legs. And these Panzers, although I do like them, I don't fit on them very well, as I'm sure you guys can see. But aside from that, it'll be a nice addition to the ever-growing crusty tractor fleet that I seem to be having around here. So anyways, folks, I do hope you enjoyed the series, and there you have it.